And now, and now, with the same energy, welcome Pastor Crabtree to this pulpit. God bless you, Pastor Crabtree. I want to. I, wa- I do want to say that I, I that First Corinthians 16 it mentions several people that work. Paul mentions several people that are worthy of due honor. And he mentions the people. There are women pastors he mentions there. There's men pastors. There's people worth honor. This man has lived his life as integrity. He is a fully voted, spirit-led, spirit-empowered Pentecostal man. Charles Crabtree is one of the pastors that I admire more than any other pastor I've ever known. He's always treated me like a real person when I was a nobody. And I still am a nobody, but most people don't know I'm still a nobody. But you may be a short guy, but you big in my eyes, buddy. God bless you. You are doing good up to that last statement. Because the wicked shall be suddenly cut short, and that without remedy. I've always thought he was too tall to be a preacher, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Love you and this great congregation. It's a privilege and honor for Mona and myself to be here. And uh, we look forward to tonight with great anticipation. Don't you think it's wonderful that two churches can get together within 200 miles and have a good time? So we'll see you tonight. Let me, oh, yeah, I've got a, yeah, okay. Quarter of 12, is that right? Uh, Whatever. Yeah. (laughs) This is a little bit of a testimony this morning. It's uh, very interesting. I got to thinking the other day that Within a few days, our immediate family, meaning my mom and dad, myself, will celebrate 100 years of Pentecostal life and ministry. Uh, my, my dad was a poor farm boy raised in eastern Maine, and a young lady evangelist came to that part of the country named Amy Simple McPherson. She came, and my father went to that tent to just a couple of miles from their farm, and the Lord uh, laid his hand on my dad, and he was that night filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with other tongues. Amy Simple McPherson came over and laid her hand on him and said, make this young man a mighty preacher of the New Testament. And my father was used to raise up the largest Pentecostal church in Maine uh, for many years. My mother, on the other hand, was from a wealthy home. Her father was George Eddy, who founded the Eddy Lumber Company, the Eddy Coach Company, the Eddy Match Company, and was actually the lumber king of New Brunswick. She was sent to a finishing school, they called it, in Montreal, Quebec, when she was out of of high school, and her father wanted her to come back after special training in this very prestigious school to become the secretary of his company. One summer night, as two of her friends and herself were walking down a uh, town in Montreal, a few blocks away from the school, they heard singing. And they went in, and it was a church, of course, and uh, they sat there for the rest of the song service. And then the two girls said, let's go. And my mother said, you go ahead. Um, I think I'll stay a while. During that time, God dealt with her heart, and she came to the altar and found the Lord that night. When Pastor Baker came to pray with her at the end, and many of the people were gone, he said, young lady, you have just received the Lord as your Savior. 
But there is much more for you. The Lord wants you to be filled with his spirit. And she said, I want everything that God has for me. And when he laid his hand on her, she broke out in a heavenly language. But the thing that really touches me is that her testimony is that she was the first person that she ever heard speak with tongues, and it was herself. Many years later, I was born, of course, and I was a, I was a little boy then, and short then, <laughs> and uh, I was nine years old eight or nine years old, and I had no interest in being a Pentecostal preacher, let alone being Pentecostal. I wanted to grow up and cut people open for big money. I wanted to be a surgeon. I thought that was the neatest thing in the world. But I was uh, at the end of a... <laughs> At the end of the Sunday night service, I was over in a corner waiting impatiently for my folks to get done praying with people. And suddenly, I don't remember anything other than just suddenly I stood up where I was sitting and I began to preach in other tongues. And my mother said I preached for over an hour, which set the pattern for the rest of my ministry. And I, I preached and preached, and from that time, of course, I have been Pentecostal, and later he called me to the full-time gospel ministry. I want to bring that perspective to you because I have watched the modern Pentecostal movement that started in 1900 and one clear on through and I have observed it and been part of it. And I, uh, I want to tell you that the first generation Pentecostals were wonderful people. It, it just bothers me to no end to hear people critical of my forefathers. They were wonderful people. And uh, I can remember my dad praying every morning early. We had, all, we had devotions every morning. We had Sunday afternoon service, Sunday night service, Tuesday night service, Friday night service, and then we had three extended revivals every year that ran a couple of weeks or more, and it filled in with a bunch of other special Pentecostals. So I was born, raised, and I was part of this Pentecostal movement, and I saw all of the good and the bad. And I want to, uh, I want to tell you very clearly that I have the highest regard. They started off, and I mean they stuck with it. They were powerful in prayer. They were powerful in the word of God. They were powerful in witness. Time after time, the Holy Spirit would fall and we would have miracles around that altar. And I can remember it to this day. And everybody, everybody had to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of tongues. And I watched that and I was part of it. So my highest regards, and then I, I began to study and I watched the second and third generation Pentecostals with some concern. I watched them very carefully, and I saw things that uh, began to disturb me. First of all, there was there was a real concern about public tongues and interpretation. And I am going to have to tell you that many ministers fail their congregations by not correcting the misuse of public tongues and interpretation. There were, of course, genuine 
genuine tongues and interpretation, of course. And I was saying in the first service that I was kind of delighted when I heard that, and that Billy Graham came to Central Assembly in Springfield, oh, 50 years ago, and uh, spoke at a conference, and uh, the place was packed with preachers and others, and, and uh, he brought this great message and then, uh, then turned around and sat down. And as he turned around and sat down, there was this thunderous message in tongues, and everybody there went, oh, boy. And there was an interpretation. It was a powerful interpretation, but, boy, it was scary. At the end of it, he told Brother Zimmerman privately, he said, you know that that anointed speech at the end of my message finished my sermon. I had time only for two points, and that anointed speech finished the third point of my message powerfully. And I was kind of excited about double cross to Baptist. I loved that, you know. But many of us, and there is a place for public tongues, let me make sure of that, and it is to be interpreted. But that is not the main forum for tongues. That is not the main forum. God uses tongues and at times. But like Paul said, I would rather speak five words in the congregation with a known tongue than 10,000 with another tongue. And there are people that do receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues sometimes for public consumption. But many of our preachers in the past were afraid to, quote, quench the Spirit and correct those tongues and interpretations or tongues by itself and not bring correction to that kind of teaching that is in the Scriptures. They were afraid of quenching, quenching the Spirit. Now, I will tell you what, I learned very quickly, and as a pastor through the years, I pastored 25 years, I always dared not quench the Spirit, but I had absolutely no problem quenching the flesh. And there was a lot of flesh that was allowed within the Pentecostal movement, and it brought a reproach to non-Pentecostals because there was not that confirming power and presence of the Lord to confirm that tongue and interpretation that really brought peace to hearts. Sometimes the flesh brought confusion. The second great thing that I believe happened is that people in Pentecost began to isolate tongues they began to see tongues as an end in itself rather than a powerful gift to be used to grow into Jesus and to become more like Christ and to have more power with God and that tongues and in that tongues by themselves one of the gifts of the Spirit, but it was not basically for public con consumption, but it was for growth and development for the believer and to lead them into a greater Christ-like life. And so it was this that began to cause great problems within the church, and I still cringe when I hear that people say, well, he got it, or she got it, meaning that they received the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, and that was the end of it. It was something in itself 
that qualified them for every office in the church. They were very much special because they spoke with tongues. And it is not an it, it is a him that comes to fill us and to anoint us with the Holy Spirit. So I have, I have observed that, and I bring to you now, that's the, inter- oh, that's the introduction to the message. <laughs> and I want to bring to you uh, the context of Pentecost. The word context has a tremendous meaning because I believe that what happened in Pentecost is that tongues, Pentecost became the text without a context. Us preachers have this phrase, a text without a context is a pretext. Now let me explain what I just said. The word context means weaving, to be woven. And what happens is that you take these texts, hello, these truths that we want to use and weave them into a solid, powerful reality, a fabric in this case. So when you weave, You take threads or experiences or truths and you weave them into the context. You add to that. And let me say right now that what you do with the context in life is to take the past and the future and you weave it into a powerful present to a powerful experience. Most people, and all people without Jesus, the context of their life is self, is ego. In the garden, the devil said to Eve, I don't want you to have a God context. I want you to have a self context that everything with meaning and purpose is woven together for self. And if you will disobey God and eat of the tree, and it wasn't a crab tree, I want to make that clear. Ah, if you will do that, then your context will not be God anymore. You will become as God, knowing what to do and what is right and wrong. And so what has happened, a sinner has the context of self, whatever pleases him, whatever pleases her, is the meaning of life. And all these threads of talent and gift and riches and all of this is woven together within the context of self. When a person is saved and born again, their context changes. They are born into a new context, and now self is not the center, but Jesus Christ becomes the center. He becomes the yesterday, the today, and the forever. Hallelujah. And he weaves it all together within this person. Now let me give you another truth very quickly. With man, it is very difficult for under, to understand the spirit is more important than the flesh. And uh, you've heard this term, I can't be there physically, I can't be there, but I will be with you in spirit. Now with man, that's almost impossible, but with God, who is a spirit, has no difficulty in saying the God who is coming physically will leave you, but he will not forsake you. He will come 
back to you, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And while you are on this earth, before your death, or before the rapture, I am going to not be with you physically, but I am going to be in you spiritually, and it is better for me to get out of here so that you can have me within and not just with me physically, which is so limiting. So here's my text. Are you ready for the text? John chapter 16 Let's look at it at verse 7. Oh my goodness, look at this. Look at that. Uh, This is better than that. But very truly, I tell you, in the King James it says, but I tell you the truth, but very truly I tell you, wow, If Jesus Christ is about to tell us and says, I'm going to tell you the truth, hadn't we better listen pretty carefully? How many would agree with that? But here I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going, it's for your good I'm getting out of here. Woo, wouldn't we love to have Jesus physically? But he said it is better for you guys that you don't have a physical Jesus because I have a better plan for you. I am going away, and unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now watch this. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Isn't that incredible? I want you folks to understand that the content text of Pentecost is Jesus Christ. It is not tongues. It is not gifts. It is he, the living God, the living Christ. And you remember Peter when Jesus was here in the flesh? Remember that guy? He was something. That's why I didn't want any of my grandkids to be called Peter. (laughs) And then later I thought, well, maybe so. Remember, Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, whom do men say that I am? And they said, well, uh, you know, there's the prophets and Ezekiel and and uh, then another prophet. Then he turned and said, but whom do you say that I am? And suddenly, Peter stepped back. (sighs) He had a revelation. The Spirit of God came to him in that moment and said, (sighs) you're not a man, you're the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus said, the context of the flesh did not reveal that to you. 
but the context of the Holy Spirit gave that to you. The Christ, the Son of the living God, flesh and blood could not reveal that, but my Father God in heaven revealed him. And it's my prayer, Pastor, in this room today, every one of us will be awakened by the Holy Spirit. And when we hear the word Jesus, we will have a revelation. He is not just another man. He is not just part of history. He is the living, victorious Son of the living God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when he comes to you, I pray that it will not be a preacher that puts you under a legalistic conviction about your sin and your failure, but I pray the Holy Spirit will now come and say, I'm going to touch your life. You have not been living right. It's been wrong. You've been living in sin, but here I am. Hallelujah. The Christ, the Son of the living God, I'm not here to put a guilt trip on you. I am here to redeem you and give you a new life in me that will resurrect you from your sin and take you away from the consensus and the terrible, terrible context of this life, this world, these politics, all of these evils. And I am going to have you born not of the flesh, but of the Spirit of God, so that you will know your life is not an isolated, sinful existence for a time, but you have been in touch with the redeeming Lord and Savior, and now he has come to not only take away your sin, but to give you a new life and a new context that even if you die, your life is more alive than if you were here in the flesh today. It is expedient I go away that the comforter might come. Oh, hallelujah. I'm running out of time. Uh, real quick. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, the, the clock is my consensus here, I, my context. <laughs> I'm, afraid, I'm in time, so I got, someday I can preach forever. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But, but let me just conclude here very carefully now, very quickly. The context of Pentecost is not tongues. The context of Pentecost is Jesus. It is expedient he goes away in the flesh so that he can come to you, God in the flesh, coming to be in your flesh. The miracle of Jesus was God walking in the spirit. The Spirit led him and guided him. Now the gift of the Holy Ghost is not just to have you speak in new tongues, but the gift of the Holy Ghost is to give you a new communication with the living God. Paul said it. Oh, he said, I speak in tongues more than all of y'all. He was a Texan. I speak in tongues more than y'all. But in the congregation, I would rather speak five words in a known tongue, but in prayer, in communication with God, I would rather speak 10,000 words for I do not know how to pray, but I know he knows how to pray through me. So when I pray in tongues, it is not me, it is him.
And when you are filled with his spirit, it isn't you that's living, it is Christ living within you. And so when you lay your hands on the sick, it isn't you, it's him. And finally, let me tell you very clearly, I really get upset at people who say that they have the baptism and their spirit filled when their spirits are not right. I do not like that. I do not like people who say they're filled with God's spirit, full of hate, full of selfishness, critical tongues, all of them together. And I say, that is not the Holy Spirit. That is the flesh. And they have fallen back into the context of selfishness and self. You are to be more Christ-like than you are selfish because he is your context he is the pattern for your life and he is the one that you must be a witness and no Pentecostal can be a witness running around with an angry crude excellent terrible spirit it denies who Jesus Christ really is and so today I bring to you this truth he has gone away but he knows better than we do hello he he has come again through his spirit. And I pray that everyone in this room will now say, I want to speak in tongues so that I can pray like he prays, so that I can be effective like he is effective. And I want to live a life that I cannot live, but I want him to live through me. So in the name of Jesus, be filled with the spirit for the purpose of being more like him and not saying proudly, I'm a Pentecostal, so I've got it. No, sir, I am a Pentecostal because Jesus becomes more and more real and I can live better and I can pray better and I can witness better. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you now. Forgive us, first of all, anyone in this room living in sin and they know they're not right and God is speaking to them. May they now confess it to you, Lord, and receive you as their redeeming Savior. May they suddenly realize he is the Savior and I confess my sins. I pray for every believer in you, Lord Jesus. Move across this congregation. And may every one of them desire to be filled with the Spirit, not so they can speak in tongues. May they be filled with the Spirit so they can be more like you. Oh, Spirit of God, forgive me for my wrong spirit at the time, for my loose tongue. I pray that you will touch my life. I want to be a witness in the flesh, not of self, but of you. And may everyone in this room now determine in their hearts